Hello, and welcome to Idea to IPO. I'm Jason Putnam Gordon, an emerging growth and venture capital partner with KNL Gates LLP, which is a fully integrated global law firm with nearly 1,900 attorneys on five different continents and roughly 40 different offices. But that's not why you're here today. Today, we're here for this fantastic panel composed of Af Hernandez, who's a principal at Next Energy, Next Era Energy Investments, Carolyn Funk, at, who's a partner at Blue Bear Capital, and Leo Vancic, who's a partner at Global Founders Capital. And they're here to discuss today investment and innovations in energy and climate. I'm going to let you, I'm going to let each of them tell you a little bit about themselves in a moment. But before I do, I want to give you a few notes for today's conversation. So we'll have a panel discussion for about an hour. I'll moderate that. The panel discussion and the questions that follow afterwards for about a half hour is gonna be recorded. So if you miss some or all of it, so long as you've registered, you'll get a copy of that in about a week. The corollary to that is, please don't share any confidential information on today's panel uh, because it's recorded and will be available online afterwards. Please fill out the audience survey. It's always very helpful to know who's in the room. And if I look away or seem a little distracted, it's not because the panel is boring, but I'm running all the tech in the background and I've got a ton of windows up. Similarly, if you've got questions, please use the Q&A function. Uh, I will not be monitoring the chat uh, as there's too many windows for me to, to monitor, but do feel free to, to communicate among yourselves in, in using the chat. Now, with that in mind, I'd like each of the panelists to uh, tell us a little bit about themselves, a little bit about their funds, the space they invest in, and uh, to the extent they like to be contacted, the, the best means of contact. And we'll start maybe with Carolyn. Yeah, great. Hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be back. Thanks to Rob for organizing and Jason being the moderator here. Um, I'm talking to you from the Bay Area, beautiful weather in the East Bay here. A um, little bit about myself and then I jump into Blue Bear and then I'm sure we're going to get into more details of, of all of that. Um, so I spent my whole career uh, working on energy transition related topics. I'm originally from Berlin, Germany. And that's where I started out working in R&D and policy together with the German government and German utilities. Um, moved to the Bay Area 10 years ago to work for Siemens, a group that's now part of Next 47. Siemens is $1 billion startup partnership and investment arm. Um, I then switched side and was the head of operations COO of two different energy storage startups, Freewire Technologies and Kaban Systems. Um, through Freewire, I met the Blue Bear team. And long story short, um, when we launched Fund 2 at Blue Bear, in 2020, I, um, I joined um, the team full time. Um, so what is Blue Bear doing? Our focus is investing in um, data and software centric technologies for energy infrastructure and climate, defining energy really broadly. So any, any technology that can touch the energy markets is in scope for us, but we're really looking at asset light businesses. So if there's a sensor or a small hardware component, that's fine, but the majority of the growth we like to see um, coming from software or data sales. Um, we invest in companies post revenue. Our typical sweet spot is a couple of hundred K um, and, and product revenue, um, ARR, if possible. We can talk about that also later, what that actually means. Um, and um, and yeah, typical check size three to six million. Focus is North America and Europe. And Europe, um, we're focusing on the beer drinking countries and not on the wine drinking countries. Let's where we have more of connectivity. So I'm from Germany. We, we have venture partners in, in the UK and in and, and the Nordics. Um, so that's that's it about us. Wonderful. Well, we're delighted to have you back, Carolyn. Uh, Leo, how about you go next? Tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, your fund. I'm still chuckling at the beer versus wine drinking countries, Carolyn. That was good. I never thought about it that way. Um, yeah, Jason, just echoing what Carolyn said, Jason, Rob, thanks again for, for having me on. Um, a bit about GFC. We are a $2 billion fund based out of Germany, but uh, we're, you know, we have a global focus. We have about 15 partners all over the world from Europe, Latam to Southeast Asia. Um, I'm one of those 15 partners. I just focus on climate. 
Uh, we are a pre-seed, seed, opportunistically Series A investor. We do hardware, we do software. We're looking for big disruptive ideas in the space. Um, and we have a bit of a long-term horizon, uh, which is which is how we can get away with investing in, in some hardware in, in, in this space, which we can talk about later, um, that might have kind of a longer term, um, uh, you know, a longer horizon for returning uh, capital to the fund. Um, before GFC, I was a management consultant at McKinsey for about four and a half years doing work in sustainable investing, ESG, advising both startups and incumbents on the energy transition. Um, before that, I uh, got a master's and PhD in mechanical engineering. So I come to VC with a bit of a technical background um, and, uh, you know, focused on thermodynamics and energy conversion. Uh, fun times. It's really exciting to be able to use those tools uh, when evaluating startups these days. Before that, I uh, had spent some time trying to commercialize clean tech in national labs, spent a bit of time at the DOE doing energy policy research in 2008. Uh, back when solar was much more expensive than it is today, and um, and did my undergrad in Las Vegas, uh, studying solar research there. Uh, and so, also like Carolyn, you know, my whole career has been in 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 clean tech, climate tech, and just very excited that you know we get to do what we do today, and and the world you know is is, is caring about these technologies and, and needing to implement them. Fantastic. Well, we're delighted to have you back as well, Leo. You always bring a lot to the panel discussion. So looking forward to hearing what you've been seeing. And AF, last but certainly not least, it's wonderful to have you back as well. I guess we've got three returning uh, panelists. It's fantastic. Reiterating, Jason, thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm also honored to be on a, on a panel with the both of you, so I'm very excited. Uh, my name is AF Hernandez. Um, I started my career at Lockheed Martin. Um, so I, unlike the both of you, I actually didn't start in climate. Um, it was a little bit of a serendipitous path where in 2015 um, at Lockheed Martin, they started an energy division. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to do strategy for them, help them in their R&D portfolio. And that's where I kind of cut my teeth and realized, oh, this is cool. This is where I want to spend the rest of my career. Uh, I was able to go to business school to pivot into that. Uh, while at Lockheed, we tried to commercialize a lot of really cool technologies, including ocean thermal, um, waste energy, a flow battery, some nuclear technologies. It was a really, really cool um, area to really learn this. And, and funny thing for a topic later later today is like they had a fusion reactor that Skunk Works was, was working on for a long time. We can talk about that later. Um, but I was able to do that. And then I went to business school to pivot into climate. Uh, go Bears and um, started my career in, in climate investing in 2019 at another fund. And luckily last year joined Next Era Energy. Uh, for those of you who know, the largest power company in North America um, and in their venture arm, uh, we look for asset kind of like Carolina asset light software businesses for decarbonization. We have a pretty broad mind mandate in what we do. Uh, and so we're pretty open on that stuff as well. Um, just for everyone online, uh, all views are my own and not of my companies. And so I'm only representing myself in this panel and every opinion of that comes from my own. I do not, I am not a voice of the company. So thank you so much for having me. We, we are delighted to have you here. I have you back app. Thank you. Um, and with that in mind, let me, let me just let everyone know sort of who is in the virtual room today, understanding that some people will be watching this on a time shifted basis. And so if you're watching a recording, we are delighted to have you here as well. Thank you. Uh, so we've got a strong contingent from the Bay Area, 25%, and then 36% from the rest of the United States. So that puts us up at about 56% or, uh, excuse me, that puts us up at like 61%, uh, which is great. And then rest of the, the attendees are from either North America, a few from Europe, and then there are some from somewhere else which might be the Middle East. Uh, that's That's been the common refrain for, for folks who fill that out. So we're delighted to have you here. Maybe we'll sort of open the stage uh, and, and have a, an initial discussion just about kind of the trends that are happening in venture in general and sort of maybe with a lens towards what's going on in the climate space. I don't know if there's anyone who wants to take a first shot at answering that open-ended question. Leo? Sure. I think Carolyn and I both unmuted ourselves at the same time. Um, I'll say, you know, following venture broadly, there's fears of a recession coming next year. Um, there's the crypto blowout. We've seen FTX and 
um, you know, loads of other uh, crypto investments either get written down to zero or 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 get written down significantly. I think we're going to start to see more startups acquiring each other as we move into next year. We've already been seeing Series A, Series B uh, rounds taking a little bit longer, and and in some cases, you know, down rounds. So it's it's. I'd say the market is is it's a bit of a bear market right now, um, uh, not just in public and private, but but in VC, we're beginning to see it. I think climate's a bit insulated. I'll, I'll uh, especially early stage. I'd say early stage is insulated. Climate's insulated. The Venn the Venn diagram overlap of those make it a little bit extra insulated. But you know we're still in discussions with founders. Um, the rounds aren't moving as fast as they did before. Valuations are a little bit more negotiable. The power has shifted a little bit more to VCs than founders, but you know we all want to get the work done. Um, so uh, let me let me keep it there. Carolyn, uh, do you see it the same way? F. Yeah, totally. And I think if if you're speaking with more generalists, then you see the world even in a darker place. I think in 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 climate clean tech however you want to call it we still see rounds get done um and they might be a little more structured in the way that they get done but um still pretty pretty nice um headline valuations or fun, uh, or round sizes that that are in the news every week um i think the the other thing that we're we're seeing um and we're also asking portfolio is um for next year's budget think think through what a couple of different scenarios could be. So just be prepared. Um, maybe your buyers are going to be a little slower um, than your um, than your project we're projecting earlier this year, or um, maybe um, maybe fundraising is not going to happen. So how, how are you going to extend runway? How are you going to um, present a couple of different scenarios so that then when things materialize a little more, you can act quickly so I think that's 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 been a um, a trend as well for sure. I'll reiterate what everyone's saying. I think I have two different views it, 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 that align exactly what you're saying. Is I think climate to me is always if you're in the stock market, climate's always had a smaller beta, which means the highs aren't as high as the lows aren't as low. Uh, and I think that's a perfect example of what's going on right now, right? Where certain sectors, like in the last you know few years, fintech, the highs are highs, the lows are really low. Um, and I think because of that, in climate, this is interesting. We're also in a very unique space where it's like right after the entire crash, the IRA passed. And there's this huge tailwinds um, for us to be able to like really underwrite things very differently. The unit economics for a lot of our businesses have shifted fundamentally, even though there's still some open questions around a lot of things in, in the IRA. Um, but I think that gives us assurance as investors of being like, okay, there's, there's momentum here. Um, talent is being reshifted. Uh, from other sectors into climate, um, and the capital markets are open in this space specifically for really good companies that are that are doing really good, you know, fundamental change in, in the climate sector. So I think it's a wonderful time to be in this space. Can, can we take that and expand on it a little bit, and and maybe I, I try to do at least a little bit of research before each of these. And you know, one one of the problems when you're doing some research and trying to get data, especially in the venture market, just like any market, is it's always you know, lagging, right? So like, if I pull up the data, at least from, from PitchBook and kind of take a look at what the most recent sort of sampling is for the climate specific, it looks like Q1 of this year is the is the latest. And, you know, according, according to that data, it looked like there were 273 venture backed rounds worth approximately 9 billion, which actually kind of tracked the prior quarter, or the average of the quarters in 2021, which is 80, uh, 283 rounds worth 11.2 billion. And the year before that would be 214 rounds worth 5.5 billion in 2020. On a, that's again, like a per quarter basis. You know, that's from Q1. That's before the IRA passed, right? So the Inflation Reduction Act, which we're calling the IRA, passed in August of this year, I think on the 16th. And Kind of interesting to see if we can kind of hone in a little bit more on kind of what you what you've observed anecdotally, maybe from Q2 and Q3, and if you see any sort of tailwind coming out of IRA. I'll go briefly here. I mean, I think there's a leading indicator as well, which is this year there have been a lot more funds announced. 
Um, so there's a lot of dry powder, you know, a lot of capital for early stage and later. Uh, some, you know, giant funds announced multiple billion dollar fund growth equity, but also some early stage climate funds. And so I think there's about ninety two billion dollars in in dry powder available for for climate tech broadly. And so that's all got to get distributed in the next, you know, three, five, seven years. I, I think the IRA just, you know, building on what Af said. Um, absolutely puts some technologies either in the money or closer to the money, right? Any Anybody that was looking at hydrogen before um, was probably having to cross their fingers a little bit. And now with a $3 per kg tax credit, which is a very generous tax credit for hydrogen, um, it's making it pretty exciting. We made an investment in a sustainable aviation fuel company that I heard multiple funds say, had we knew, had we known that the IRA was going to pass, we would have done that investment too. <laughs> so, um, you know, just there's a, there's a sustainable aviation fuel tax credit, right? So um, there's home electrification tax credits available, right? There's el electric vehicle purchasing credits available. And so I think that's definitely put the wind in, in some rounds. Um, and so we'll see, I, my, my sense is Q2, Q3, Q4 is going to look like an upward trend as a result of of of, of the IRA. Um, that's a sense. I don't I don't have the numbers in front of me, but there were a lot of rounds getting done this year. Carolyn F. Uh, Go I, I, for I, it. So um, it's complicated because I, I think on the other side is something that I try to be acutely aware of is um, certain. Certain companies are dependent on project financing, project development, and things like that, and interest rates continue to go up. And so even though the IRA came in with a lot of these credits, with interest rates going up, it, it kind of either is a wash or sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. So sometimes understanding that on what's going on in the credit market and how that affects the business, like the underlying economics of the business is complicated. So overarching, yes, I do believe so, because investor sentiment is like there's momentum here, there's a lot of investors coming here this isn't gonna just go away overnight um but this is the fun part of my job is then we we have to dig in and understanding the different market trends and 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 how they affect the underlying economics yeah i tot totally agree on on that uh, we do invest in companies that provide software for wind solar energy storage and there are these kind of contra contradicting trends with uh with the um, with money just having become more, more expensive while um, the technology cost might be pushed down through some of the um, tax implications here. Um, and I think as in the early onset of COVID, you were kind of lucky and might be interesting to some of our audience if you're really early stage, if you're not having to be measured by making revenue um, selling to customers but if you're still an early stage of developing your technology because that way i mean you don't need for example as i've said you don't need project finance necessarily yet um, and then when once you get there things things might have um, changed again so i think um, evaluating companies that are that are at the earlier stage that those those tailwinds from IRA and, um, and the general kind of um, energy markets, I think we're 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 seeing. Um, but yeah, if you're if you're at later stage, and we do invest in companies at Series B and a little bit beyond, um, then you you're you're measured by 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 different KPIs. So, so earlier, Leo, you mentioned, I think it was you who mentioned the sort of recession. Um, and is and I think to a certain extent, some some of this conversation, you know, when you're talking about the credit markets and interest rates and kind of what the Fed's going to do with that, these kind of these things sort of intersect. Um, is there any any more insight for any of the panelists um, in terms of how some of these conditions are impacting and maybe making certain certain technologies or certain business models more interesting or exciting to invest in or and what, kind of what you see coming down the pike in terms of opportunities? I mean, I think one of the big problems, and I'm just jumping in the first one, so Leo doesn't have to go, um, 
is anything that is kind of unclogging supply chains is really still kind of in, in need. Um, and 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 to, at least to us, really, really interesting. So anything that can enable these projects to go out into the field faster, um, be it um, be it on the energy generation side, but even like electric, we talked about electric vehicle charging infrastructure, um, deployment, permitting, processing, stuff like that. Um, I think that's that's where everybody's scratching their heads around how are we even going to get all these projects and all these all this infrastructure out out in the field um quickly enough um to yeah to also benefit and also meet the timelines that we need to uh kind of get to i don't i won't say turn around anymore but to uh, get to the minimum um mit mitigation of of climate um impact that we're that we're needing um so anything that that can get into the field fast is um is top of mind for us including kind of um things that that um help the manufacturing components of of, of what's out there um so can can you build solutions that help um electric vehicles, batteries, or um, robots, or I don't know, drones being built faster. I think that those those would be top of mind. I think to, to, to add on to what Kevin just said is like, there's a few macro trends happening that I try to keep an eye on and see how that affects markets. Uh, the one big one kind of to, to your thought is onshoring. Right. And I think because onshoring has become such a big deal due to the pandemic, due to geopolitical factors, everything that's going on, um, due to the IRA and, and battery manufacturing, um, you now have to deal with the fact that labor costs are higher. So there's only certain spots that you can squeeze to be able to cut costs. And that's where optimization, you know, and I think those are the drivers that, that she's kind of speaking to is how do you optimize that manufacturing? How do you optimize the supply chain? How do you optimize that to be able to come cost parity with what's going on, given the geopolitical and, and all everything that's going on to onshore? Um, I think that's a huge factor of us. I think an open factor to me is our industry has tailwinds for growth, even during a recession, given the fact of how big of a demand it is. But that's up to a certain point, And I, I, I don't know what that point is. Um, right. I think the IRA has given a lot of momentum for us to be able to do that. Usually, historically, during recessions, um, countries do spend on infrastructure to be able to, you know, help um, citizens get get jobs and help spur the economy, which I think is what we would we would fall into, especially in climate. But that only goes so far, and and I also don't have a clear view of like how deep a recession it is. If if I did, I would be very very wealthy, uh, <laughs> uh, but I don't, and so like there is no clear view to me as how long it's going to last, where it's going to go, and things like that. But I do understand that um, usually historically infrastructure investing has increased during recessionary periods to help with the economy and, and the IRA and certain aspects of of things getting passed or like the Chips Act and things like that are in that favor. It's just can I read the trends of those and align it with the type of investments that we think work in decarbonization. Um, and that's kind of where I spend a lot of my time. I think there are a few other trends that are happening that kind of prop up climate tech, um, you know, kind of where I'd be looking. Um, the war in Ukraine, um, which is simultaneously pushing Europe to find natural gas and coal as fast as it can, but also has you know, this interesting effect where they're trying to become energy independent and do more renewables. Um, so heat pumps are pretty exciting um, to stay warm, to stay cool in Europe. They run on you know electricity. They're more uh, uh, they're more you know more efficient than the status quo. I think in Europe, you know, ESG disclosure ESG disclosure requirements are 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 making business kind of forcing businesses to to look more green, uh, to to do you know to to be more green, um, state legislation like in California we banned ICE vehicles, right? So electric vehicles are still a place to look, um, you know, for for venture. You know, we need some kind of technological innovation or 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 maybe business model innovation around that. Um, it is a crowded space, but there are still some bets there. Um, 
So yeah, energy independence in Europe, uh, disclosure requirements, banning of ICE vehicles. You saw France just banned, um, I think, any flights that were shorter than two and a half hours. They're pushing folks towards train modality of transport, which is pretty exciting. So I think governments are beginning to, to crack down on this a little bit more, um, both with you know the stick, as I've just mentioned, disclosure requirements and kind of banning certain flights and, and the carrot as well through, through the IRA. Um, probably some more trends in there too. Um, talent was mentioned, uh, which we can cover in a moment. Um, but uh, yeah, they're all kind of propping up, propping up the space. Yeah, and California banned uh, banned diesel trucks, right? Starting twenty thirty five. Yeah, well, I'll, yeah, that, yeah. It's uh, exactly, exactly. So we'll see. We'll see as we get closer to 2035 whether they're going to back off, right? Sometimes it's you know Vanguard. I think was in the news this week because they had made a net zero commitment and then backed off of it. But um, hopefully the commitments stick. Yeah. Uh, no. No. I mean, and I was just trying to recall. For some reason, my recollection was that that ban applied. I think to a narrow segment of trucks. Maybe, maybe it was like uh, trucks that were. I think their concern was trucks that were old trucks that were idling at distribution and intermodal yards. But I don't. I just don't recall off the top of my head. That was sort of my puzzled look. Is I. I know, I know there was a diesel ban. I just don't remember if it was sort of like blanket on all trucks or not. Uh, I have to dig in, but it looked like. In Newsom signed an executive order ending the sale of new diesel or gasoline in the state by 2035. So I thought it was a little more blanket, but I I need to dig in. That, that was for for I think for car. I mean they did both. There was there was I think a car a gasoline and car, and then there was a separate diesel one. Uh, uh, but anyway, there was obviously a lot of activity, uh, you know, sort of on the the legal side of things, the regulatory side of things, which is pretty exciting. Um, how how about in terms of sort of specific technology. I mean, obviously one really large announcement that came out sort of earlier this week was in Lawrence Livermore Labs, which is, I guess, close to me since I'm in the East Bay, uh, you know, and announced a, a breakthrough on Fusion. Uh, Af, did you say you you were you worked on Fusion when you were at Lockheed? Maybe. maybe. No, you did not. You did not. You I said. didn't. No. So I, while I was at Lockheed, I, I did not personally work on Fusion, but our Skunk oh. Works team was working on a a portable fusion reactor that I think it's been, it's, it was public while I was there and uh, it's still pretty public on it. And, and so it's something that I think brings a lot of value to society in general. Yeah. Right. Uh, go, go ahead, Leo. If you talk, or yeah. Whoever wants to talk about sort of like the, the technology involved yeah, and sort yeah, of what yeah. the implications of, of that is. Yeah. So when I was in grad school, I wanted to do fusion research. This was in 2011 to 2016, and there wasn't a lot of government support for it. Uh, um, and I remember getting a tour of the fusion reactor. It's for an engineer or a scientist, it's a very exciting problem. I mean, you're creating a star in a box, uh, a lot of different ways to do it, uh, which I'll mention in a minute. But it's very difficult to stabilize the plasma, um, extremely difficult from an engineering standpoint. There are Few companies trying to do it. TAE, um, you know, uh, uh, Commonwealth Fusion Systems, Zap Energy, Avalanche Energy, which is trying to do kind of a smaller scale portable system. The the specific uh, milestone that was reached by the NIF, the National Ignition Facility in Lawrence Livermore, was around a method of fusion called inertial confinement, where you take, you know, hydrogen at a very high level. You take hydrogen, you put it in a little gold box that looks kind of spherical and you shoot it with a super high powered laser. It's a batch reaction, meaning you have to put the pellet in and shoot it with the laser. The milestone was that they made, they, they were able to get more power out than they put in through the laser, which is exciting and it's a milestone. But imagine, you know, you're shooting this little pellet with a laser. <laughs> imagine now making that commercially viable. I mean, I agree with one of the chat, for the folks in the chat, the joke, the joke with Fusion is it's always 20 years away. Going from a batch, Super science lab based reaction like that to something that's continuous, commercially viable, cheaper than solar plus battery, which is going to, you know, you're going to have to beat the economics of, 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 of renewables plus storage, which gives you that green base load. Um, there's a long way to go, an absolutely tremendously long way to go. It's very exciting. I have friends that work in fusion, super exciting. I think we need to be working on fusion in parallel. 
Um, it's, you know, it, 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 it's, 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 it's right for venture if you're the kind of venture fund that doesn't mind having extremely long horizons. Um, other than that, you know, it's still it's still a lot of science and 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 material science and engineering that needs to go into it, and it's a long ways away. I can say more, but I'll just I'll I'll, I'll set it there and see if Carolyn and Af uh, agree or want to dive in with additional detail. I I don't think I'm equipped to have more detail than Leo on this, but uh, I totally agree. But I think. I mean, this is this is all the longer term discussion. What I find really exciting is that, and I think that's changed over the last two or three years, is that these headlines or these news make headlines in general media, and we talk about kind of energy and and climate every day in in general media. And I've been working in this space for coming up on 20 years now. Usually when I brought a topic like this up at like a coffee or dinner conversation with friends and family, everybody looked at me like I was crazy. And now it's like, yeah, that's 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 the talk of the day. Like if John Oliver does a, does a show focusing on the US grid, it's so mainstream. I'm I'm like, wow, this is this is awesome. I'm not the weirdo in the corner anymore. So I think the general trend is very positive that we're all talking about this, albeit some of the technologies might take a lot longer um than than we have um in, in the immediate, but I think we have such a big um bouquet of solutions at our hands that we just need to kind of pick the one that's right for the time and right for the place. So the, the exciting part about this industry is like there is no one size fits all solution um, that's going to solve everything. We're going to have, we're going to need all the different solutions and all the different um, locations of the globe. So nobody will be left out. I agree with everyone. I, I'm just like a nerd about it. When you see something like that about fusion happening, it gives you like hope. And and I think that's the like, skill. That's what you're talking about from like a, from like people don't do this every day. It's just like, Hey, like this is a re like, this is something of a big milestone that can gain momentum. Uh, I think public opinion is necessary for this, especially if I agree with Leo, like this probably is fit more for government funding due to its long time horizon. And for that, you need public opinion on, on how this is gonna, like how to fund this and make sure it stays in the budget and make sure society sees the long-term value of it. Uh, secondary to that, I think, unfortunately, Fission has a marketing issue and things like this add value to understanding for, for regular people to understand that, hey, nuclear is not just what you perceive as war and stuff like that. There's actually a good use for nuclear if done correctly. And I think that's exactly what this is for. That being said, yeah, from a venture perspective where time horizon is something that is a top of mind on how we review our investments, like it's a long, it's it's a long time away, but it's one of those that I think are it's like the space mission, space mission during JFK era, right? It, it gives you a long-term goal. It'd be it's for us as a society to be like, hey, what would life look like if we had unlimited energy? Uh, and then at that point, like what could we create? And and I think that inspires a whole new generation of 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 entrepreneurs and scientists and everything like that, they can also pursue this. You're, you're on mute, Carolyn. Yeah, we have sorry. a really interesting chat going on here yeah. on the side. I don't know if you guys are monitoring it, but, but um, I think folks chatting about battery technology and hydrogen, and we're talking about fusion. And I think um, the interesting part for us is, as venture capitalists is to think about not just what's the right technology what are the right trends what's the right timing but also what's the what's the subsector that is investable for us so um from our lens and blue bear where we're not focusing on um on on hardware in investments um and not all don't also have the kind of very um, patient capital that can wait for 20, 30 years um, to return is like, how, how do we, how can we think about areas that, that are investable for us in the space? So for example, thinking about hydrogen supply chain um, or optimization technologies for, um, for the um, plants that will be either uh, stationary mobile hydrogen pumping around or 
Um, so think, thinking through that, and I don't have perfect answers for it, but I think that's what you uh, out there as a founder can help us with is like, you, if you're targeting one of those big trends, how are you breaking it down so it becomes investable for, um, for folks like us? And we're, we don't know everything. You're most likely the expert in the, in the space. But even thinking about mining, it's like, yeah, of course, building a, a mine to, or having a new, I don't know, drilling or um, explosion technology might not be the right venture investment, but um, figuring out where and how and how to optimize um, the operations could be very investable areas for us. Yeah, just to build to build on what Carolyn's saying, you know, since we do a bit more hardware, you know, hydrogen is. I'm seeing hydrogen in particular showing up on the chat, so I want to address that one. Um, it is both. I, it's both underhyped and overhyped. I think it's it's hydrogen's very nuanced. Um, I agree with a, a person named Michael Liebrich on this largely, uh, who has this thing called the hydrogen ladder, and I largely agree with it. I think I don't think we're going to see hydrogen for use in ground transportation unless it's off road vehicles, maybe like mining or or um, something a little bit more remote for delivery trucks, like the kind that drop off everybody's Amazon or Walmart packages. I think those are going to go electric for long haul trucks. I think some segments are going to be maybe hydrogen, but most of it's going to be electric for for electric for for passenger vehicles. Electric has won already. I'm pretty sure. I mean, Toyota has the Mirai. But I think you know they're going to quickly abandon it for BEV for a number of reasons. BEV uh, battery electric vehicles for a number of reasons. I think the well to wheel efficiency isn't great for hydrogen. The infrastructure already exists for electricity. Um, so I think you know electricity in ground transportation I think makes more sense than hydrogen from everything I've read. Where hydrogen does have a use could be in decarbonizing aviation. So we, as you know, GFC was before I joined, but we invested in universal hydrogen. It's kind of one of the two or one of the several um, hydrogen uh, startups that are trying, that's trying to decarbonize aviation. It's, it's a little bit of a longer term bet before the FAA approves all of those, um, you know, new forms, new powertrains, but could be there uh, useful, could be useful in steel where you need high temperatures, could be useful in green chemicals, I would say, in ammonia production and methanol production and sustainable aviation fuel production. Could be useful in decarbonizing maritime, perhaps as an input for methanol production. So just all I'll say is if hydrogen is interesting to you, there's a lot of conversations happening around where it makes sense, where it doesn't make as much sense. And as a founder, just try to try to stay current on kind of where the trends are, because the VCs are going to be um, you know, following these discussions and having having a sense of 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 where these technologies can make sense or not make sense. Maybe, maybe sort of shifting and zooming out uh, from just specific technologies. Uh, maybe we could chat for a minute about some other trends that are happening in the climate space. So, in terms of maybe talent talent flow or opportunity for talent to get uh, involved. In the climate space, I think that'd be helpful. And I think Leo, in in this, you know, it's not necessarily a question for you, but I do recall in August when we had you on the panel, you, you provided a number of resources for folks who are interested in getting involved. Um, so open for you to either sort of recite those to provide any additional ones, and obviously for Carolyn and AF, if they if they have any, um, you know, resources that people should take a look at or check out if they're interested in getting involved, it'd be fantastic to have that conversation and. Let you know. Let let the audience know. Maybe Carolyn, since 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 Jason called, you know, just briefly. These AF Carolyn, you probably know exactly which resources I'm going to mention. Climate Tech VC. It's a newsletter. My Climate Journey. Um, climate Draft. Uh, org. Climate Base. Uh, Terra. Do. Uh, these are all kind of communities slash areas where you can congregate, read what's new, find job boards. Um, that's a starter list. Please, you know, Carolyn, F, feel free to add. Uh, a, a few things. One, please don't be intimidated by the space. Uh, I, I think sometimes we all, uh, we've been in the space for so long and we all talk about things so easily be, and acronyms and all that stuff pretty quickly because we've been in the space for so long. Um, 
it's dual sided one please don't be too intimidated by that we all started somewhere as well and we were always lost on those things and number two is everyone in the space wants more people to get involved so if you let us know where it's like hey i don't understand this or it's it's hey it's like we're going through let us know and we're happy to like i think all of us in space are happy to sit down with friends and just break it down and and, and teach everyone so i think one it's just about the humility of the talent number two is um i'm also the the um i'm also the co-founder of uh vc familia which is the largest latinx vc organization in, in, um in north america this has been a topic that we've talked about a lot is increasing diversity, not only in climate, but just in overall, but like specifically in climate um, and energy where sometimes communities that are affected by by carbon are the communities in lower income and highly diverse communities. Uh, so it's, it's a big deal there. Uh, and I want to encourage as many people of color to please get involved and please, you know, get involved in the space in any way, shape or form you can. Um, and then number three is you do not need a technical background or any kind of engineering background at all to get involved. Um, I don't have one. Um, there are a bunch of roles in climate that do not require it. Uh, and if you're really interested in it, like you can just get involved. And then there's a few free university courses just to sometimes if you're doing deep tech, understanding thermal dynamics and, and a few of electrical engineering is, is worth it. And that doesn't need a degree. You can easily just go in and, and understand the basics really quickly on a few YouTube videos. Um, so for all of those factors, like, yes, please, like we, we need as much really good talent as, as, as we can. And maybe to talk a little bit about the other side, we've been reading a lot about the um, folks from general tech um, leaving, um, getting laid off or just looking for for new, more um, mission-driven journeys uh, for their personal careers. Um, we have a, we have a talent partner on our team at, at Blue Bear, and she always provides really good insights. And I think if you're looking to hire some of the talent that has been let go or is, is looking from the bigger tech companies, and if you're a smaller startup, really be on the outlook if they're really available to you. A lot of these folks um, have um, some kind of um, a severance package. So they might not really be looking right now. They might really start looking kind of in Q2 next year or so. So for a startup founder, like another quarter is like another lifetime. So um, be be on the lookout and, and then also for some some of these folks, really early stage startups might not be the perfect fit um, in terms of both um, compensation that they're looking for and also in terms of, um, I mean, the, how they're used to work, like a lot of the remote, you might be more of an in-person company, um, some of the, the work-life ba balance, the perks that you can provide. So I'm just... Like together with our in our portfolio, we're also really hesitant. Some of these folks might be a really good fit, but make sure you have a good filter initially so that you're not jumping through the rounds, which for smaller companies take a lot of um, take take a lot of resources speaking with these candidates that are in the end not not really interested in working with you. So I'm a little more cautious maybe than some of uh, some some of the peers like. LinkedIn or uh, Twitter VC, um, it's like, yeah, I'll, I'll come work in early stage uh, climate. Not so sure about that. And, and Carolyn, sort of changing gears a little bit, I think earlier, AF mentioned or used the term sort of overhyped and underhyped. Are, are there any areas, especially sort of in the sort of software space, where you think, you know, it's already, it's cooled. It's like sort of already been, been built out, whether that's sort of carbon accounting or, you know, I think there's a lot of action maybe going on in the carbon markets. I'd love to get your perspective. Uh, yeah, I, th I, th I think the, the one space, um, and I'll get into the carbon space after that, the one space that we just recently did another deep dive in was, um, EV charging software, 
um, to manage EV chargers, to get drivers to where they want to be, um, really the whole landscape of that. Um, we're basically adding a company at least every day. <laughs> it's, it is incredibly busy. So I think if, if you want to get into that space, really think deeply what, what your USP is and how you stand out. Because what I've been seeing is companies pitching to us, they spend they maybe have 20 or 30 minutes talking to us for the first call, and they spend 15, 20 minutes explaining why they are not like X, Y, and Z, and what makes them different. So this is always really hard then to get to actually the meat of what 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 you're doing and the team and such so um yeah on the on the carbon side carbon um carbon accounting carbon um verification um everything that's combining the web three and carbon space i think that's part of two different ice ages or winters um the a little bit of the more crypto -y winter and then um the carbon kind of market reshuffling. So I think that's that's a little harder to get into and a lot of capital has already been invested. So I'd also think about just looking how much ca capital has gone into the market. What's the TAM? Um, and is is this is this big enough for, for somebody new to come in? Because um, sometimes it's just, or all, always not the best technology wins, even if you're building a better technology or a better way of verifying these credits, um, um, there might be some incumbents with the, the, the b b bigger names out there that are already doing it. And you might have a really hard time just to beat them because of the name and money they have. And just to unpack a couple acronyms, so TAM would be total addressable market. And then I think you said USP, which is your unique selling proposition. Is that, yes. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, no, no problem. No problem. We have <laughs> we have a whole range of audience members, both live and yeah, you know, time shifted. Thanks, Jason. I, I you first half. Go for no, it. Go, uh I go back and forth about this because I think um hype is sometimes good and bad. It just depends, right? Um, sometimes hype is because the market is just too early for where it is, right? And sometimes it just takes a little bit longer. Um, I think I'm conflicted on carbon accounting because the market signals are there that this is necessary, but I think the market just might have gotten ahead of itself at a certain point. That's kind of my my view. Um, whether and from an investor standpoint, my biggest thing is like, at what price did you come in, right? Like, I'm 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 worried about IRR and MOIC. And things like that, which is turnover rate of return and multiple invested capital. <laughs> Jason, I saw your face and I was like, I got this. <laughs> um, and so I think it's it's an interesting perspective where as an investor, you have to be disciplined enough to understand what's going on in the ex in external market and whether you play with it or not, right? There's investors have different styles, different way of investing and things like that. And, and you can make money on either market, right? Um, you have to realize like, People have made a lot of money on the crypto space, regardless of it, like crash, like investors did make a lot of money. And there are a lot of funds that that did cash out and made their made their money and things like that. So um, we always just see the media without understanding like what the fundamental economics of things are. Um, but the, I do think there's also other markets that have been kind of in the in the forgettable markets like iot or things like that that are making a resurgence based on different types of market dynamics right and so it just depends on the wave of things um obviously batteries were like hyped a few years ago then it's kind of like puttered along and now with the ira and everything that's going on batteries are now like coming back up again so it just depends on different market dynamics that are happening um and it's hard to predict i think that's like Otherwise, every VC would have a top quartile fund. So, and to your point, um, we have uh, we have invested in the space, and we think that, um, for example, actually Leo and, and us are co-investors in a company called Abatable um, that is um, that that is very active and actually going to do some uh, kind of nonlinear growth um, in the space. And I think that this is 
um, talking about the carbon uh, carbon marketplace. Um, if you have the right team um, and you you get in early enough, then um, they will figure out where the market is going to go. And this is, I believe, this um, the the case with the bathable, for example. Yeah, just building on what Af and Carolyn have said, you know, there there are climate is a very wide climate tech is a very wide uh, sustainable landscape. A lot of different places where you can invest. Some sectors have passed the venture capital stage, you know, dramatically, right? So, like renewables are no longer in the world of VC. There might be a few opportunities here or there, but it's mostly infrastructure, project development, right? On the early stage. There were things that were early stage two, three years ago. I would agree with Carolyn carbon accounting. So it depends when you got in, right? At what price, carbon accounting, carbon offset platforms, um, to some degree, MRV measurement reporting verification around carbon credits was, you know, it's a little bit kind of later stage now. If you're an early stage investor or if you're a founder looking to build things, you know, it's important to do your research on Crunchbase or just online seeing, you know, what, who are the other companies out there? Have they raised a lot of money? I'm just echoing what what's already been said on the panel. Um, I'd say carbon accounting, carbon offset platforms, home electrification is a space that's becoming a bit crowded. I've seen now, it's just hard. I take a pitch with a company and I like what they're doing, but it's, you know, I can't differentiate between what they do versus many others. Um, you know, whether it's uh, uh, putting heat pumps in the home or electric vehicles in the home, um, you know, and there's some companies out there like um, Lunar, which raised $300 million, not from VCs, but I believe from Sunrun and SK Group. And you got these well-funded behemoths out there with great teams and makes it a little harder to gain conviction on it, um, to, to, to place a bet, right? Doesn't mean we won't place a bet, it just means that you have to do extra diligence to understand what the differentiation is. Uh, for that particular company, so I'd say, you know, there are there are some spaces that are that are getting a bit crowded, but um, you know, we need all the talent we can get in climate, and it's it's a very exciting time. So I want to end on a high note there, um, but you know, just just come in and do a bit of the homework, and 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 you know, if you want to build a startup in carbon accounting, for instance, just you know, look around and see who's done it first. And it might give you an idea of like how you could do it differently or if you can pivot into a different business model. Was there anything you want to add, uh, uh, Caroline? It looked like you were about to say something, but if not- I Yeah, I, I, I wasn't sure. I also want to talk more about high notes. I think we, we're, heavily looking and haven't made an investment in the mining space. I think thinking through like the supply chain of raw materials, that's like an area where I think um, it's it's hard, but really um, if, you, if you can figure out a way um, to, to ask point of the onshoring and really, um, re really surfacing, <laughs> no pun intended, um, um, what, what is out there in a different new way I think that's that's an area where we're going to see much more investment, both from the venture, but also other types of um, of, of financing institutions. For folks in other regions too, there's there's also geographic arbitrage that you can do. So if there are models that you see working in the U.S. but you don't have it in India or you don't have it in the Middle East, bring it there. You know, we invested in a company that does carbon accounting in India. Had it been in the U.S., it would have been too late. But, you know, since they're one of the few players in India, um, they're just, you know, racking up customers uh, left and right. It's, there's a lot of demand for it. There's also been recent policy shifts that kind of pushed them in that direction. But, you know, thinking with an international lens, take a model from somewhere else and just use it. It's going to take a while for that company in the U.S. to probably expand to your region. There's, you know, enough focus here in the US for them or, or in Europe per se. So that kind of geo uh, geo arbitrage, so to speak, can work in your in your favor. Well, that's terrific. Well, we, you know, so we have allocated about an hour or so to for a panel discussion. Um, I think what I usually like to do is, is give each of the panelists a, a moment or two to sort of reflect or share any thoughts that they want to with the audience before we pivot into the Q&A portion. Uh, so I'd like to do that. I'd like, you know, to the extent 
Af, Leo, Carolyn, you, you've got a few thoughts that you want to share with the audience uh, and your contact information. Maybe we'll kind of move through that. Then we can uh, move to the question and answer section. And you know, to the extent we can pick up some of the conversation that we've had now, if we don't any get any questions, we can address it then. But Carolyn, do you have any further thoughts you want to share with the audience before we pivot over? Um, sure. I'll take out my 2023 glass bowl and tell you how it's going to unfold in a second. No, uh, just kidding. Uh, we don't have that glass bowl, sadly. Um, I, I mean, you, you heard it uh, in my intro. If you are looking to build a company um, in the um, more software and data centric space for energy, infrastructure, climate in the broadest sense, um, feel free to reach out to me. I think LinkedIn is the easiest and fastest way. Uh, you'll just find my name on LinkedIn. I don't think there's anybody else there. Um, I'm unique, uh, I don't know, um, but you'll find easily find me. Um, I think um, what we haven't discussed about today and we have still, we're still wrapping our heads around um, is the whole topic of um, how, how are the advancements in AI um, going to impact our sector? Uh, we we chatted about this a little earlier today in the panel uh, when we were just warming up, um, and we don't have a clear opinion on that. I think that is always a really good sign on there might be something there that you can uncover um, because we're not, yeah, we're unsure ourselves, so it would be great to be educated on that. And we're thinking, um, of course, everybody is talking about chat GPT and GPT-234, DALI and other fun things out there, but how, do, how is it actually applicable um, to the climate space? We don't know yet. Would be really curious to hear your thoughts. Thank you, Carolyn. It's great to have you back. Af, any, any final thoughts for the, for the audience? Yeah, but thank you so much for joining us and, and uh, yes, putting up with our points of view. Um, in reality, I think I'm just waiting for the moment when it stops being climate and this is just the way most companies operate and we realize that our emissions and and how we build things affect our environment. Um, I think eventually within my career, hopefully that that becomes a norm or we don't have this climate tag and it's just operations. Uh, but overall, I think it's necessary. I think uh, we need really good talent to enter into the space to really help us solve the problem um, as an investor. And I think Kellen's uh, echoed this, it's the founders that come up with the really good ideas and, and really try to change our view and the trajectory of the world. And that's kind of what we need um, in this challenge for us to get to where we need to by 2030. Um, and overall, yeah, I, I also reiterate this. I think there's, we can talk about the crypto blow up and the fintech blow up and things like that. But I do think there's a lot of innovation that's happened in that space that, that actually helps us in climate. Uh, I do think the banking industry has kind of been upended and things have been shaken up a little bit. And how does that affect like climate and how does that affect us like with financial reporting and things like that? I think that's necessary. And same thing with chat or chat GP3, uh, GPT 3.5, 4, uh, AI modeling, all those things. Um, I think there are other market trends that us as climate investors need to be aware of to see how that affects either the technology um, development or technology adoption within within our sector is absolutely necessary. But thank you for having me. I appreciate it. We're delighted to have you back, Af. And Leo, any, any final thoughts and best way to contact you? Yeah, uh, I'll start with best way to contact me. You can find me on LinkedIn, uh, Leonardo Banchik. Um, and then um, I'll end on, yeah, I mean, we need all the talent we can get. I'll, I'll end on the the a bit of the numbers and kind of the sense, right? So we're, hopefully I don't come across as too nerdy here, but we've got about, you know, 40 gigatons of, of CO2 in the atmosphere uh, uh, that we're putting out year annually, forgive me. Um, uh, and, you know, by, it's not a 2050 problem. Carolyn and F and I were talking about this before the panel started. 2050 is Kind of a ways away. Uh, my daughter will be my age by then, I think. But uh, uh, but 2030 is really where we, you know, this is in the next seven years is where we need to decarbonize by 50 to 55 percent. So we need to stop the tap, stop putting out emissions, 
um, for CO2. We need to steeply mitigate methane and nit nitrous oxide emissions as well. But then we also need to do carbon removal, which we didn't talk about during this uh, talk, but it, there's a load of ideas and you know, kind of fresh excitement around carbon removal. We also need to drain the tub. So we need to stop the tap and we also need to drain the tub because there's too much CO2 and GHG in the atmosphere because we didn't, you know, as a species, we didn't act fast enough 10 years ago. Um, and so, you know, we need to pull out and start, you know, getting to two gigatons by 2030 and then five to 10 gigatons by 2050 annually of carbon removal. So kind of wrapping this up, putting a bowstring around it, there's kind of CO2 mitigation and decarbonization, methane reduction and carbon removal. And those are all rich areas to tackle uh, as an entrepreneur. So um, it's, yeah, it's an exciting time. Let's, let's, let's hope that by 2030, we can make a lot of progress together. I also forgot to mention, yeah, LinkedIn is the best way to reach me. Also, I have a very unique name, so I'm pretty sure I'm the only Af Hernandez on there. That's why I put my middle name in, because there are a whole bunch of Jason Gordons, including, I think, some people who may be in prison, which is not me. Um, so uh, th that's a great way to contact me as well. I, I also, and just to sort of do a, a quick plug for myself, in the last couple of months, I've developed a resource for entrepreneurs who are interested in, in learning about kind of how you create and then capitalize a company from creation through your initial preferred stock financing. I call it Venture Capital Camp. It's in sort of a beta test mode. I'll put a link to it if you want to check it out. Uh, any feedback that you have is, is, is welcome. So I'll put that in here. Moving on to the questions. So one of the questions is uh, related to basically how you can get involved. And I think the panel did a great job earlier providing a number of resources. That was about 40 minutes into the conversation for those of you, well, you know, who want to go back after you get the recording, you can check it out. But in terms of doing research and learning about other companies that are available in this space, I think Crunchbase got mentioned at least once, but like, are there other other resources that the panel thinks is a good place for folks if they kind of want to be able to drill down on a particular sub-vertical within in the space and they're trying to learn more about what's out there and they're doing their diligence to see whether or not, you know, there's enough, uh, you know, they're at the right time basically to get involved. I, I always, if you're new to the space and you want to get educated, I think Project Drawdown is a really good way of truly understanding from an emissions standpoint, like how to really think about the world. I think it's very simple. I think it doesn't get too complex. Uh, I think that's an easy way to see like where the emissions are coming from, from a global perspective and break that down. That's always my favorite. If you're not in the space, there's a lot more deeper topics and better reports that go deeper, but I think that's a really good entry point. Uh, I can't reiterate enough about Climate Tech VC. I think the newsletter and their research is absolutely top tier of to what they do and, and being able to go deep. And if you ever want to go on a topic, just go in there and Google it really quickly. Um, uh, yeah, perfect. They'll, they'll just post it on there. It, it's it's an amazing platform. If sometimes Bloomberg New Energy Finance puts out reports that are free that you can go deeper in, uh, I think that's a great resource um, to be able to do some research. And then this this is up to you, but nerds like us three do this. There's a lot of university reports out there um, that can go really deep. And I think that gives us a differentiated view. Those are very dense <laughs> and, and, and it takes a while to kind of get through that. But I think that gives you um, like original like thought thesis on what's going on in the space. And, and you can look at those at Berkeley, MIT, Stanford, Michigan, uh, a lot of these and the national labs all come out with really good reports that can give you that. And that that's the second tier if you really want to go deep on any topic, in my opinion. So so if you're if you're in the audience and you've got questions, now's a great time to enter them in the question and answer section or question and answer section, and we'll try and get them answered, especially ones for the general applicability. Uh, but until we get one or you know, a couple of those in there. I do want to at least touch on something we talked about earlier. Carolyn, what's your perspective on how AI is going to impact the climate sector? 
I just put the the question out there um, to folks to make me me smarter. Um, just to uh, jumping back one loop to um, to the, the the topic before, I wanted to mention that there are also great groups out there that you can join if you if you're not ready to build your company, but if you were in research and R and D and just want to get out there, there's from for example. Um, um, and there are fellowships out there, for example, from from a group called Activate. I'm also going to put this in in the um, chat here. And I think those are also like if you're just in the really early stages and and want to be exposed, um, just as an example. And there are a couple of more of them out there. Um, now back to AI. Um, I think I think there. Are, two different levels of what we're what we're talking about when we really speak about AI. Um, one is the more general, like, um, yeah, it's kind of machine learning algorithms that help us build better tools that are um, that are usable in the field. And I think um, we're definitely well beyond where you could come and say, oh, I'm building an AI company. Um, AI is baked into what what you're building. It's it's one component of your software. So, for example, we have investments in companies called, for example, a company called Raptor Maps. Um, they build a system of record for a utility scale solar and um, and do a lot of image processing as one of their sub products. Um, there's a lot of AI involved in that or a company called Urban that does um, risk management for utilities, uh, co-invested here with uh, with Nextera and AF. Um, they are, um, they, they use AI models um, to predict risk on any given work site. So that's, that's just part of their stack. Um, then the, the next, and I think, um, what we're seeing with the kind of new advancements uh, and some some of the breakthroughs that happened this year, um, these tools will just help these companies build even better products. Um, and I don't I think that's that's technology iteration in a way. Um, is but my question would be more: Is there a leap? Is there something that we can now do totally different? For example, do you maybe need to hire less software developers because AI can write the code and you don't, you can build a much leaner organization um, because, uh, because you don't need to hire expensive software engineers and anybody of, from us can just ch tell chat GPT um, to, write, uh, to write a code snippet and stitch that together. Um, so that's where I'm like scratching my head and un unclear where the future might lie. Or is it just that call centers are going to be more efficient? I honestly love talking to bots. Uh, at some of my afternoon conversations, once you're, if you're back into booking a flight or something, that's like, <laughs> you don't have any anything else to do. Um, kidding aside, I think there can be a lot of value in augmenting your business. Um, using using technologies like that but is there something totally new um i haven't found it yet but please let me know yeah we we, we desperately need this sort of consumer focused bot to sort of do all of the negotiating with the uh, airlines and the you know banks and everything i think but that's a topic for a different day <laughs> How how about I guess there's one so we've got another question in the Q and A and please if you've got a question uh, submit it that way and if if not probably in the next you know next couple minutes we'll give everybody back a little bit of their time, uh, but this one goes to tackling the problems uh, related to agriculture and I think maybe the last time we had one of these panels. Uh, Leo, you indicated you were super excited about sort of ag. Are you still excited about that? Or with sort of what are some of the developments that the panel sees in ta in, in ag and with respect to climate? Yeah, um, if you you know look at the food that you're eating every day, uh, it is full of carbon emissions. All all 
all along the, the supply chain in getting that food to your door, not just in transportation, but if you're eating meat, cows especially have a ton of embedded carbon emissions and methane as well, which is a, you know, got a higher global warming potential than CO2. Um, there are a lot of opportunities for innovation in ag, a lot of interesting companies doing things like green ammonia, doing things like microbes for nitrogen fixation. Um, I invested in a company that makes robots that does weed management um, uh, on farms so you can get away from pesticides. You also don't compact the soil. So you allow for something called no-till agriculture, um, which is uh, currently widely understood along with other methods like cover crops to lead to sequestration of carbon in the soil, which is a huge, you know, it's, it's, it's a very large uh, sink for, for, for carbon. I think there's like 850 gigatons worth of carbon that we can put back in the soil if we figure out how to do it right and get farmers to change their behaviors. Um, I haven't even touched on, you know, uh, alternative meats, uh, right? Alternative proteins. There's the plant-based kind like Beyond Meat and Impossible, which I think tastes great, but for some reason, you know, their sales are flagging a bit. Maybe, cons maybe it was a hype cycle and consumers have gotten over it. There's folks working on cultured meat, uh, which is still a bit expensive. There's folks that can just go vegan. I see in the chat that that does help, but the plants also have some, you know, your eggplant has some carbon emissions in there too, I should say. Um, there are companies working on stopping the methane emissions from cows, right? It's not contrary to popular belief. It's not their farts so much as it is their burps. And Breakthrough Energy Ventures just announced a company that's, you know, that they incubated to do a vaccine that eliminates the, 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 those bacteria that produce methane in the gut, the, in the rumen of, of cows. There's other folks that are working on stabilizing chemicals that they can add to feed or add to water. I'm given a bit of a laundry list here, but you can see I mean, it's, a, it's a big space from robots on farms to how we tackle cows, how we handle methane emissions at dairies. Um, you know, there's... Go ahead. And, Carol, and, and even even we had a little bit of a chat around local farming um, or reading in the chat here, um, like saving carbon emissions on on the supply chain. What can you grow? Um, maybe indoor farming and things like that and containers. Um, so, that, yeah, it's it's a long list. Yeah, it's a long list indeed, but it's a very it's an exciting space. Um, for a long time, I think ag tech was considered not as great a return, you know, compared to something like maybe fintech or uh, some of the, you know, web solutions we rely on today. But I think there's a lot of trends and market pressures that are that are that are making that an exciting place to 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 play. Well, fantastic. Well, we actually this is maybe the quietest audience that I've seen now. I've been seeing out of the chat because. I've kind of got task saturation as is, and there have been other other panels where I've followed along in the chat and sort of gotten sidetracked wildly off. So, um, but unless the panelists have anything else that they specifically want to address, I was going to maybe bring the program to a close at this point and give you back a couple extra minutes in your day. Is that just just yeah. just one quick thing? Um, yeah, please. I, um, to be honest, I think this this has been the most interesting, and I'm sorry, maybe you want to download it, the most interesting chat going on while I, I was on a panel here. Uh, with That's fantastic. Uh, idea to I, I've, I've, we've, I've gotten we've, uh, trolled before in the chat. And so just, I know, that's I not know. Happening. Not, and not I've had panelists you. get trolled too. So you just never, you know, these things, you never know what's going to happen. That's wonderful though. Yeah. Um, and there was, there was a little bit of a discussion around, um, about around batteries and um, where else to look. Um, and I think um, I not, not just to market um, one, one of our deals, but I think there's so much going on in battery intelligence and AI. We've invested in a company out of Germany called Acure, but there are others um, that actually predict battery failures. That's a, a great application for, for AI. There's a lot of data out there about batteries. Um, also, um, new battery chemistries. I think that's a really exciting space for, uh, for AI applications in general, um, kind of material exp um, exploration. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot that you can, can read about um, the, the battery um, space. And there's um, 
Oh, now I'm blanking on the name. There's a battery conference every year in January here in, in, uh, in the East Bay. Um, I have to look it up, but um, yeah, ping me on BNEF, LinkedIn. It? It's not BNEF, mobility, no, no. Is it? No, no, specifically um, but, on batteries. But uh, yeah, there's, so I think batteries will remain an exciting space and new batteries, um, battery recycling, um, battery material exploration. So yeah, if you're in that space, feel free to reach reach out. I spent a couple of years during my career building battery packs, so that's dear to my heart. Sorry, Jason, and I'll let you finish it. Oh, oh no, no, I, you know, I'm not trying to cut anybody off prematurely at all. So thank you. Leo, did, did you look like you had to add, you want to add something? Yeah, just to agree with Carolyn, the chat is pretty active, but but no worries. I mean, there's some interesting things um, popping up as well. Uh, you know, repurposing, even just the very last chat, repurposing coal uh, for either, you know, coal-fired power plants for geothermal or for nuclear. You, know, you get to use some of the CapEx that's already available uh, on site, you know, uh, the condenser, the um, the heat exchangers, uh, et cetera, the, the pumps. So some interesting, you know, there's there's a lot of interesting technology. Maybe as a technologist at heart, I get excited about that stuff, but uh, um, a lot of work to do <laughs> across, across the landscape. And then a lot of what we've been talking about is really just in the US and Europe, right? And there's so much more. I just got back from Argentina, by the way, if everybody sees me drinking mate, that's what this is. Um, so I'm going to ask you should, about that. We should like, talk oh, about... Hey. Yeah, we should talk about VCs, uh, Latino VCs, eh, haciendo cosas, cosas juntos, but um, go Argentina in the World Cup, by the way, which is on Sunday, everybody should watch it. Congrats to France that won while we were doing the panel. Um, <laughs> but uh, just to say that, you know, there's a whole world out there. I just got back from Argentina and the, nobody was thinking about electrification. Nobody was thinking about you know, the work that needs to be done. Granted, Argentina doesn't have the carbon emissions that the U.S. has or that Europe has, right? But, you know, this is a global problem. So dig in your local community, see what you can do. If you can start a recycling, you know, uh, a program locally, or if you can do something, again, that geographical arbitrage, take a model that works elsewhere, bring it to where you are. This is a global problem. So that's what I'll, that's what I'll end on. Uh, if if you want that, so there, I do see in the chat, uh, somebody's asking about the chat. I think um, if you want the chat, send me an email and I might be able to send it to you afterwards. Uh, so I'll put my email here. Uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm very excited to be on the panel with this group and see like, and the talent that's going into the space and the fact that we all kind of realize that this is like a, pertinent need in our society. I think it's amazing. Um, lo and behold, I wouldn't expect the market to be where it's at back in 2016. So at a certain point, um, I know we all feel this urgency to do that, but also let's also realize what's happened over the past six years um, and the momentum and the progress we all have made. Obviously, it's not enough, but um, it's way better than it was six years ago. Uh, and there's a lot of momentum in the space and a lot of things have happened that we wouldn't have expected six years ago. Um, so with that, though, uh, I th I'll reiterate, I think we need really good talent to pursue not only technological advances, but also business model advances um, for numerous reasons that I can go into in long rabbit holes and diatribes on this. Uh, but there's it's not just technology, but it's also how does the unit economics work on that? Can business models change to be able to allow that? Uh, and that that's where I was saying, like the fintech revolution crypto revolution from a record keeping standpoint i think that that can actually add to that but i i'm very excited what's going to happen over the next 20 years i'm sorry leo you're saying no i just thought maybe your audio went away but it might have been my internet forgive me um no but that was I totally agree the unit economics the business models absolutely all right uh unless anyone has anyone anything else they want to add i want to thank each of our panelists today, Carolyn Funk, who's a partner at Blue Bear Capital, at Fernandez, who's a principal at Next Era Energy Investment, and Leo Banchik, who's a partner at Global Founders Capital. I want to thank each of our attendees, whether you are live right now or you're viewing on a time-shifted basis. I especially want to thank Rob Lau at Idea to IPO for organizing today's event, and uh, also my firm, k &L Gates, for sponsoring this and enabling it. And uh, with that in mind, 
I'll let everybody get back to building their great companies and uh, everyone else out there looking for them. So take care. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Happy holidays, everyone. Yeah, happy Thank holidays. You. Thank right, you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.